Hey guys, welcome to the Laying Foundations podcast. This is your co-host, Davis Hambrick. Joining alongside me today is Walker Lott. What's up, Walker? Yo, what's going on, Davis? Man, today was a, a ton of fun, and I'm really excited for everyone to hear it. You know, just for those of you who don't know, we have the essential craftsmen on our show today, uh, and that is Scott and Nate Wadsworth, and they are some incredible dudes. Uh, so much wisdom flowing from them today. And I just, I can't wait to listen to it again. You know, some of the things I picked up were... Uh, be tenacious and don't give up. That was just something he spoke about a lot. He was saying, you know, for those who just start, it sets you apart from everyone else. And it just just start. You know, eventually you will fail. That's like guaranteed. But just start. You know, and when you fail, get back up again and, and do it better. And I mean, it's just so much wisdom. Uh, you know, and, and that's what Scott talked about a lot. It's just to be wise, to seek wisdom out continually in, in your life. Will, you'll be fine. You know, you'll have up and downs, but you'll be fine. What do you think about it today? I, I loved it, Walker. Those are great points. Um, but guys, guys, check them out. It's called the Essential Crafts, and they have a channel on YouTube. They have another podcast called EC2. I mean, these these guys are all about construction. And the cool thing is it's a dad and son duo, and it was just a, a great dynamic of a team. Um, it, it was really enjoyable to get to talk to them. But like what Walker said, the wisdom that Mr. Scott and Nate, that they both had as a, as a dad-son team – is is crazy it, like we talked about you know the lens you look through for success we talked about um taking that constructive feedback like walker said you know guys that's one of our um big big values is to welcome feedback and the thing i really loved was how that the outlook that scott had was even if the, it's a guy you know you really don't even like be willing to learn. He might be able yep. to teach you something. And sometimes it's even ways of not to do it. We've all had a boss where it's like, man, I don't really want to do this, but you learned a way to not treat people or not do things. And so I, I just loved, we talked about construction, but they had just had a deep, deep context of, of, of wisdom, of applying things to your life. And I think it's a, a great time to just see four guys geeking out about construction, having a good time. Man, I couldn't have said it better than myself. It, that was awesome. This episode was great, and I can't wait for all our listeners to hear it. You know, towards the end, listen to Scott just talk about pride, and that was a fantastic one. That just it, that one just hit me. You know, just remembering right. that, talking about it. There's contention in your life. You know, both parties are are probably acting out of pride. That's right, and and that's something huge that definitely is very applicable to my life as well. That's right. uh, and it's something I picked up a lot from him. So it, it was fun, and I, I yeah. can't wait to hear it. And so uh, without further, we'll go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that just to, that one, if we could take the one thing out of this podcast and something that really made me look back in my own life, kind of like what you said, Walker, is there is there's several times when I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. Several. And guess what? It, it's OK for someone to not agree with you. And I was listening to um, it may be Greg Kershell leadership podcast, but um, he was talking about the same thing. Ultimately, when there's times when I feel pride. I feel like there's no way that I'm wrong. Those yeah. are ultimately the times I should even listen even more. And I think that's great. Just the whole pride thing. I think the construction industry, most of the guys and gals were just prideful. But, you know, we are made to be technical people to know about our craft. And so we have great pride and responsibility in doing so, but we can overstep people with our relationships. And I just thought that was a great point to kind of remember. No, I agree with that, man. It's funny you brought that up. And today in church, we, uh, our, Pastor Miles said that that you know you need we need to listen, to understand, and not to respond. Literally said the same thing, which goes along with Love our it. core values. So I thought yeah. that was hilarious and, That's awesome. and very uh, hit, hit, excuse me, hit you in the face. You know, it's like, man, all right, I didn't need to hear that again. Mm -hmm. Well, well, without further ado, Scott and Nate. Welcome to the show, guys. We really appreciate and Scott and Nate being willing to come on the. The show with us today it's a, a really special treat uh, because they are from the essential craftsmen on youtube and i'm sure many of you have heard of it uh, if you haven't go and check them out because their videos are incredible and they are exactly what we aim to do on this podcast and just share the the construction world uh knowledge and understanding with people out there who may not know a little bit about it and and who haven't heard of it before so scott and nate just to start off tell us about yourselves both of you you know where you're from what do you do how did you get started in construction anything we just want to learn more about you nate who goes first you want to start uh, i'll follow you how about you okay. you you lead All and right. i'll do cleanup okay that's that that works pretty good so i i'm an old man i'm 63 and uh i spent 
two whole terms at Oregon State University as a young man. I thought I was going to be an engineer, but I was distracted by Dixieland jazz music. I played with a little band called the Jazz Miners, okay. and uh, we played for President Carter and booked a tour across the country. And I remember thinking the eminently practical thought that I don't need an education because I'm going to be a star. And so I quit school and played music until I got tired of that. And so I had always liked to build, you know, forts and tree houses and boats as a kid. And, and so I thought, well, I'll just become a carpenter and build houses. And so I started that about the time that I got married to Kelly, my high school sweetheart. Um, and I just started working for different guys. A big recession hit Roseburg. Unemployment was 23% in 1981, which was three years after I got married. Wow. So we, you know, construction is so cyclical, you know, it, it just is a series of booms and busts. That mm -hmm. is the way it always has worked and always will work. And so Kelly and I moved to Wyoming, um, Northwestern Wyoming. And I worked there for five years um, in the Powell Cody area loved every day of it. It's a wonderful part of the world. And then that economy tanked about five years later, the, the local commodities went down there. Um, and so then we moved to Las Vegas. And I, so in Wyoming, I got a, a, a well rounded custom home experience. I worked for a fellow that went from, you know, dig the basement, pour the walls right up through hang the doors and everything. So that was great. Wade Welch construction. And then uh, moved to Las Vegas, and I, I got a pretty wide construction experience there. Everything from production, piecework, framing to commercial work and mm. layout and tilt ups and small bridges and uh, nice. all kinds of stuff. And I, I ended up running a startup um, commercial concrete company for about two years, and then moved my family back to Oregon. Okay. Um, logged there again. I logged as a kid with my dad and uh, for other logging. Uh, operations. My dad was in the woods industry. Moved back to Oregon from Las Vegas, tired of construction. Dad and I logged for two or three years, and then I could see the handwriting on the wall there. That just wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And so I got my Oregon general contractor's license, and I've been a small general contractor here ever since until YouTube came along. And that <laughs> is Nate's conversation. There you go. Well, my, uh, my background's a little shorter. I graduated college in 2009 and in 2011 I quit the accounting job I had for a couple of years because real estate prices were so low it was kind of an obvious opportunity and so I spent in the next nine years buying and selling and doing kind of small rehabs on my own um, real estate deals and then in 2017 I guess or 16 maybe I had a deal that was kind of my biggest deal that was very slow is a slow approval process I had a lot of uh, extra time in the day. So we started making YouTube videos, at, which kept me busy while my little development was pushing through. And, and that is what allowed us to build our YouTube channel. We, we kind of both were able to dedicate the appropriate time to, to grow it. And at this point, it's what I'm doing uh, with my full-time energy as well. And um, basically, if someone's, you, our YouTube channel tells a story, of course, you can go back and watch our first videos from then to now. And there's several projects um, started there we may talk about but uh, that's kind of where we're at at this moment yeah I think that's awesome guys I appreciate y'all both being willing to open up and share there you know one of my first few things that I thought was pretty cool about Mr. Scott I didn't know that you were in a jazz band you got to play for President Carter tell me about that yeah so I'm in high school here in Glide Oregon and and there was a local guy who he owned a small general store his name was Neil Hart okay. and he was also a carpenter and I can remember going into his general store and he would be quizzing kids about their algebra problems. He was just a remarkable mentor for a lot of guys. Hmm. And, and uh, he ended up showing me how to use a framing square, explaining to me how to cut stairs. Wow. He just was a big impact on me. But earlier cool. when I was in high school, he was talking to my mom who was a very accomplished pianist um, hmm. and said, Lorraine, there's a kid's band up in Eugene, um, 80 miles north, and they're looking for a trombone player, and I think Scott should try it. And this was under the auspices of the Traditional Jazz Society of Oregon, and Rusty Styers had put together a kid's band. And when I started with them, the youngest was 13, the oldest was 17, and I was 16. 
Mm. And they were essentially unsponsored. We were essentially unsponsored. Um, Rusty just wanted a band and he just made it happen. And so I did that for four or five years before it, that kind of ran its course. And then the band played at Disneyland. After I left the band, they played there and several of them are still pro or semi-pro. That's awesome. So even whenever you were thinking you were going to be in jazz band, you ended up learning how to use a framing square. From yeah, how about that? Movement. I think that's awesome. And if guys, you know, I want to ask y'all, what was it like for both of y'all's perspectives? You know, Mr. Scott and Nate, I would like for both of y'all to chime in on this. Scott, when was the first time you remember having Nate around while you were growing up in construction? And Nate, what was your perspective of that? What was the first time you were around your dad getting involved in construction? <laughs> Well, you went right to the sore subject. He, there you I, go. <laughs> and Nate started going with me and cleaning up and sweeping and carrying boards and stuff. What, like when we moved? When we moved, you helped with the houses probably that we built in Las Vegas. You remember as, as much as a kid can, yeah. As much <laughs> as a kid could, yeah. Because we moved to Oregon when you were in sixth grade, seventh yeah. grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then. You know, when I was on my own logging at first, there wasn't much for him to help with. But, but um, there was there was a fairly he helped me a lot, and and my next boy did too. But I I made the decision not to turn my boys into carpenters because Good. I I saw that as having sort of sold myself short. I saw myself as I should have stayed in school, oh, wow. and and I didn't want to sort of predestine them for that. And then when Nate started improving properties, he, he uh, kind of went right past the carpentry thing to, to the bigger understanding of doing projects. Right. And, uh, and so that, that's kind of how that went from my perspective. Yeah. In Las Vegas, uh, you know, dad, you're working for a big company, so you can't really just drag your kids onto any old job site and yeah. show them the ropes. And that being said, though, I do remember a couple instances when I was probably seven or eight, maybe, maybe nine, but on a Saturday being on a job site with you, dad doing odds and ends. And, and a couple yeah. things that, that I remember playing his day learning and, and I still do them basically first kind of lessons as a kid for a job site is if somebody asks you to, that they need something like a tool or a piece of material and they're standing there waiting for you, you got to run and get it because the entire job is waiting on that delivery. And so that, that really hit home. And I'm, I just, I still just run all around the job site, usually just getting a broom or boards and stuff, but that was a lesson that I really made a ton of sense. And it's probably helpful in all sorts of aspects of life when people are waiting on you. So, um, yeah, you know, when your dad's a contractor, you don't have to be on the job site for things to seep in. There's tools loaded in the garage at all times. Um, dad just coming home thrashed and filthy and, and seeing him, you know, even helping people in like service oriented things, just watching him just, you know, tear things apart and, and do what he does was, there's a, there's almost like a, a, I don't know how you think of it, but when you, when your father can do something, you almost instinctually think that you have it by birthright, you know, like yeah. right. you can do that. Therefore I can, which is, I think a good thing because I, even though I didn't have, you know, a lot of technical, maybe I certainly didn't work in the trades, but I cert I just by kind of being around it, maybe felt like some of it has just kind of come in through osmosis and i think that's a good thing so uh, there, there's a lot to there's a lot you can learn just from just from having it in the house and the tools in the garage and and a dad who's on a job site because you, you kind of you just kind of observe and know what, what's what what real work is or what this type of real work is uh, yeah yeah the kind of questions um, for both of y'all coming off of that i mean it's, it, even going along with you talking about being with your dad and just learning it's like yeah i can easily do this you know is there a quote i'm gonna butcher it but it's like Either you think you, either you can or you can't. It's like whatever you think, there you will be, or something like that. And it's yeah. like if you think you can, you might as well just go do it. <laughs> but man, going off of the real estate thing, because that's I love real estate, and Davis knows I was going to head this way real quick. So you mentioned that you had an accounting degree in, in or in '09, you graduated mm -hmm. with an accounting degree, started doing that, and then realized that hey, real estate's kind of a direction I want to go first of all what made you see that and then second of all you know how did you get the whole process going of buying and selling rehabbing and uh are you just now doing YouTube full-time or are you also kind of doing that on the side as well uh well maybe like you I had always been interested in real estate I remember the first time I learned you could own it a, a neighbor kid 
was telling me how a square foot of land in this desert we were playing in in Vegas cost a thousand dollars. And I thought about Jeez. it for weeks, like one square foot costs a thousand dollars. I never did the math to see if that's right or not. But I remember from that moment on, just kind of learning like, oh, you can own this. And I was also my whole life kind of interested in buying good deals on things. So garage sale. Right. And anytime I, I sensed I was buying something at a good deal that like was really exciting. And so I kind of put these two things together at a young age, like, wow, what if you could get a good deal on something really expensive, like a piece of real estate was the most expensive thing I could imagine when I was a kid. And maybe it is, but so I had always wanted to do real estate as well. And in terms of how I got in, to be honest, it was kind of dumb luck because you don't, you didn't have to be a genius in 2011 to know that real estate prices were low. That's fair. It, yeah. it was the lowest they had ever been, you know, at least um, in, in uh, <laughs> nominal after, terms. After the crash. Yeah. yeah. And so it was kind of, it was kind of obvious. And I was, again, just lucky that my wife at the time, we didn't have any kids and she was working full time enough to pay our bills. She was a teacher. And so I was just so lucky and fortunate that and she was willing, I kind of told her I was going to quit my job. And she, I think she like burst into tears, basically, like, why would you do that? But, you know, it only took a few days for her to be like, yeah, actually, it does make a lot of sense. And it was we took a, a chance, but it wasn't a very big chance because real estate was on sale. And honestly, any looking back, any deal, any property I had bought, I, I could have, you, you kind of couldn't lose. And so at the moment, no, I'm not doing real estate deals. I have some properties that I've acquired and put together that are um, generating income for me, but that's not my primary um, business. And I'm looking forward someday to kind of getting involved in it again. It's definitely, a, it's just a super fun and dynamic business. And it's, it's for me, like the perfect marriage of construction and deals and people and solving problems. And it's just a really terrific, like, oh, it's almost like the, it's almost like the full package. That's that's awesome. And I, I know this is not a real estate part of podcast per se, but you know, so many things I've listened to and talked with people about is exactly what you're describing. Just easy. It's fun. It's something that everyone can do. Just no one really knows about it. And so going along off of that, you know, you talked about you're just doing YouTube now. We'll kind of transition a little bit. But first of all, how did y'all just get started in YouTube? Because I'm sure when you got started, it wasn't as big as it is now because YouTube has kind of just taken off over the years. Uh, and then when did y'all decide like, Hey, this is something I want to start doing full time and just kind of cut all ties to everything else. So Scott or Nate, whoever y'all want to start off with. Nate, why don't you tell them about the first YouTube video you put up right after you made that website for me? What, 12 oh, okay. years ago now or something? Yeah. Um, well, I guess big picture. And as everybody knows now, um, my dad here is a, you know, kind of a master and a very unique craftsman and has all these unique right. skills and, there was always, he's in kind of a small town and he's, it was always sort of a, a puzzle for me. Like, man, how come everybody in the world's not like buying and ordering things from, from Scott Wadsworth here. So anyways, I, we took a couple tries at it. We made a website and we made a YouTube video in 2008. You talk about being early to the game. Yeah. I don't really feel like we yeah, were, but sure. we kind of were in 2008 and we put up one video. It was a slideshow of a lot of the blacksmithing things he, he did. I was in school at the time, so we didn't have time to pursue it. And to be honest, I didn't, YouTube wasn't what it now, it wasn't what it is now then. So I don't think we even would have thought that it was a thing to do. But in right. 2016, we put our first video up and it was kind of trying to do the same thing. And the goal was to uh, let, allow more blacksmithing to happen and, and working in the shop. And my grandma was alive at the time and, and heading towards needing kind of full-time care. So we were thinking, hey, maybe if, if we um, could get a little audience to, that you could sell blacksmithing items to. Um, why not? And also, to be honest, I've always kind of enjoyed media and, and sort of digital content creation. I've never been good at it, but I've always been aware of it. And so it was a fun like test for me to kind of try something new and, and make a video, which I had never done before. And so and basically after we did the first one, um, it was almost like uncovering this uh, <laughs> I don't know, like a gem you didn't realize you have, like, like you polish a rock. It's like, oh my gosh, there's not right. a rock, there's a diamond. Because um, my dad's really good. He's really natural, as, as you guys know. And once that, that kind of clicked, we're like, oh my gosh, you can do this. And I could probably figure this out. And so we kept doing that. And, and it was really one foot in front of the other. But the original idea was sort of to maybe we could build an audience and, and sell swords and knives and axes and blacksmith oh. items too. Yeah, and Nate kind of had to twist my arm because he had been 
you know, he, he's a millennial. And so he'd been keeping track of the internet um, evolution. And he, I think he had kind of been seeing what was happening and he's an entrepreneur. And so I, I think at least in the back of his mind, maybe in the front, he was thinking, wow, there's a lot going on on the internet. Mm -hmm. And, and so he started, he was up, he and his, he was up here. I think your whole family was up here for Christmas. Right. And, yeah. and he said, you know, dad, I think we ought to make a video in your shop. I said, pardon me. He said, yeah, I think we ought to make a video on the shop. I said, well, what for? He said, well, we could put it on YouTube. And I said, well, yeah, what for? And, <laughs> and, and he said, well, you know, people like to watch stuff and they like to watch guys lay brick and guys. That's right. You know, and I thought, I thought it was just strictly cat videos and, and uh, you know, <laughs> car wrecks. I didn't think it was anything more than that. Right. And so he brought his iPhone out into the shop and the lighting was bad. And it was a time in the shop when I was installing a crane. Okay. And so it was just complete chaos in there. But he said, no, that's all right. People won't care. I mean, it's interesting in here. And so we filmed one on that power hammer. Mm. And, and so as we began to, as we started watching what the reaction was, and it was slow, right? It, it was very slow and tentative. And, but we began to think, huh, I wonder what's going on here. And then he made a video about four months. We probably put up about one a month sort of there for about four or five months. Mm -hmm. right. And then he made a video called the blacksmith's anvil that kind of went a little bit viral. It got 112,000 views over the weekend. Wow. It, it just got our attention. And so it, it was about a year after we put up the first video that we monetized the channel so that the, the algorithm would begin to promote, you know, mm. and that coincided, like he said earlier with, some luck the timing was really auspicious because we both could set aside some time right then mm -hmm. i remember we had a conversation what should we do and we thought well we have to do something we can't just ignore this and i i told him that i could probably tread water for six months i could invest six months right and and he was you know developing his 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 storage project and he could commute about once or twice a month so anyhow that that's where it kind of it was his idea and, right. and uh, way it went. Yeah, I and mean, not to mention, you know, you said the first video y'all put up was in 2008. That was right at the housing bubble. Yeah. So was yeah. that was that also affecting you guys? Uh, at, at that time, no. I was in school, okay. and um, Dad's been he's been he had a long line line of work always, you know. And so I, right. I'm sure things maybe the list got shorter. But at that moment, we were kind of busy with the more traditional sort of job and school. Um, and that was sort of, you know, it was kind of a test and something fun to do. And really, he had acquired a, a whole lot of really beautiful photos from all of these things he'd made. So it was almost in some ways just to kind of put those up permanently so the photographs didn't get lost. But yeah. you no, know, at the time, at the time, that wasn't, I, I can't say we were really strategically thinking that that was going right. to do much for us. No, I, I remember, though, that 2008, 2009, it did knock the props out from underneath me. I mm. thought I was going to do some property development and a small general contractor in Oregon. And like Nick said, I always had people that wanted work done, but the phone mm -hmm. calls started really slowing up, you know, and I, I, was, getting kind of, I was getting kind of sweaty, you know, yeah. the, the properties I had bought, you know, I was, I wasn't quite underwater, but I only had about, you know, that much clearance, the, you know, and it was really funny. I, I had just gone into escrow on a sale of these properties mm -hmm. when like it happened, you know, so that was a jumping in a bathtub of ice water. So keep that in mind with property <laughs> development. That's okay, right. it, it can eat your lunch. Yeah, up and down. It is, yeah. yeah. But uh, so that 2008 thing was, was uh, it was a marketing test. Okay. And, but when 2016 came along, it was completely different, you know, mm -hmm. and, and although Nate's exactly right, my mom was failing. I had an obligation to take care of her. It was going to restrict my ability to go out and do additions and remodels and be away from where mom was. And so he, he was kind of trying to generate a little more of a, of an awareness of the blacksmithing thing as a, as a reliable revenue stream when I couldn't go out and, and take the construction jobs for a while. Right. And uh, I would imagine when y'all first started this, you would have never thought today, you know, we would have, you know, two YouTube channels, a podcast, and that would be what the, the main thing y'all are going towards. Um, I don't know. Have y'all ever heard of John Maxwell? Uh, no. He, he's just, he's a leadership guy. And you know, what it made me think of when Walker and I first started this, I had to really grasp this concept of 
um, you know, trying to figure out where you want to go. It's hard to find out in the future, but to get there, you have to have consistency. And so he talks about how it's a whole lot easier to – or it's a whole lot easier the day you stop having consistency, you fall down that hill. But every day that you're slowly growing, it's like an incline. So it takes just – each day, it takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of time. But the day you stop, you fall. Mm-hmm. So True. gradually over time, since 2008, you guys have just been consistent with putting out these videos. And now, you know, where, where you guys are at now, I think that's really cool. And, you know, that's just my little – my little. Yeah, thing. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Now, when did you get to the point in your YouTube career that you decided, hey, this is something that we want to start doing full time? Was it one video that just absolutely took off or was it just kind of a gradual sort of playing with it a little bit? Say, ah, you know, maybe we could do it, but it's not really fair yet. So my memory of that is uh, exactly one year after we put up the first Essential Craftsman YouTube video, we put that up in January of 2016. Exactly one year later, we had 17,000 subscribers and, and Nate had strategically been putting off monetizing the channel. He had a, he had what I think has been maybe our most important insight at the beginning to not worry about growth, but just worry about making the best videos we can. That's right. Right. So, so one year later was when we had the conversation about, okay, it looks like we have to do this. Hmm. So that was January of 2017. At least that's the way I remember it, Nate. Is yeah. that the way? Is that what the way yeah. it went down? And it's kind of, it's kind of like what you mentioned, Davis, although a little different about putting one foot in front of the other. Because to be honest, there there wasn't like a moment that you know you were now officially full time. In fact, even right now today, we are in a in the completion phase of a project we started years ago, and so <laughs> it's almost like I don't know the the journey the journey has led us here, but there wasn't necessarily one moment where we're like, we're going to build a, an online business. This is our goal. It was more like, we're going to yeah. make these videos and then see what happens. And then we start the house projects really like, let's build a house and make videos about it. There was never a time. We never had a chance to stop making videos. You know, it's like yeah. when you start something, you got to finish it. And so in some ways that's kind of the story of essential craftsman because we started these mm-hmm. things and, and, and we need to finish them. And so, uh, yeah, that, that being said, there was definitely a moment. I remember we had several phone calls at the beginning of 2017 because I, I was already, um, my, my business, my real estate development was kind of on the side. It was on the back burner going through permitting and engineering and stuff. But, but my dad had to basically stop taking clients. And that, so I didn't have to like cut the cord or pull the plug on, on a business that, that I had built up and he did. So for him, that probably was much more of like a, a cold, you know, bat jump in a cold bath of water. Um, because it, it takes a lot of time to make these videos. You almost wouldn't believe mm-hmm. it. It's almost embarrassing how long it takes to put these things together. And, uh, it, and so, and we needed both of our full time to do it. So we were lucky to be in that, in that time in our businesses where we could, we could do that. Fortunately, th- you know, the growth we saw over the first year was pretty predictable. And it had been predictable over a year. And then throughout 2017, it was kind of following that same trend. And so we were kind of able to do the math and say, okay, it's safe to assume we could probably keep growing at this level. And if we do, the income from all the different parts of YouTube will should grow at the same rate. And that's kind of proven to be true. So it was we had a we had a, a little bit of foresight just from that the couple years of 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 growth that we could we felt like we could predict with, with reasonable accuracy that there would be something there, even though it did take a couple of years that was really paying the bills, but we had reason to believe it would, it would get us there. And, right. and we also felt, especially me, I mean, so, so Nate's right at the, in the middle now of his prime entrepreneurial part of his life, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I was at the end of the prime entrepreneurial part of my life. I mean, I, the, the, the candle was pretty well burnt up. Huh. And so... And so for me, at least, it was, look, it would be crazy for me not to, to try this. Because like he said, the trend was positive. The signs were auspicious. Um, I was not getting any younger. Um, I had kind of pigeonholed myself here in Southern Oregon as far as what I do and, and what I was comfortable doing. And so there was no reason to think that I was going to suddenly invent another wheel. Right. And so e- even though I had arguably more to lose i also had arguably more more to gain Mm. sort of for the last 
you know, decade or two of my ride. And so that that all kind of added up. So I wanted to back up and talk about the idea of continuing steadily up the incline of, yeah. of consistency and habits. I, I've heard about and read about something called convergence. And that is at a particular time in your life, the different skills and aptitudes and relationships and and uh, charge accounts and educate everything can kind of converge. And, mm. and we had that in spades, uh, I guess have right now that in spades with Nate's skill set and my skill set and this window of time with YouTube, it does seem like the classic sort of textbook idea of convergence. Right. And then another thing that we'd be interested in, I'd be interested in your questions on or observations about is that the comment about if you stop on that incline, you slide back. There's no stasis. You know, there is no stasis anywhere in life. And I have learned now that if you rest, you rust. My mm -hmm. concrete stakes are rusted. Good. Okay. Yeah. And they didn't have rust on them since I bought them. Since I bought those square stakes, they never had enough rust to even talk about. Mm. And I'm the same way. I, I'm losing my calluses on my hands. Okay, I'm not <laughs> bragging about that. Right. And, and I was up yesterday logging with Cy Swan, gathering up those oak logs that I cut down a few months ago for mm -hmm. another content stream. And I exhausted myself doing what five years ago would have just been a hard day, you know? That's yeah. Cool. That's so cool. it's very interesting that you can't stop on that incline. Well, I think it, it's so cool. You know, Nate kind of talked about the it's what y'all did was literally the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of just start something. You don't really know where you're going. You have to find out what you're going to do. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, Scott, you have your experiences and y'all are literally bringing that to life for the YouTube video. And that's the convergence y'all are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I wanted to go next was on um, our last podcast that we're, we're actually going to put out this Monday. Walker and I talked about how there's a correlation between knowledge and time. And for you, Mr. Scott, as you said, you're, you're not a young man. And so you've been around construction uh, a whole lot. And so your experiences of going from um, working and doing finished carpentry to doing concrete, uh, then logging, and now you're doing your own kind of your small custom home business, all these experiences you've had have given you great knowledge. And I mean, that's the essential craftsman. So from your perspective, what would you tell someone or what are some qualities that you would tell someone to have if they want to be knowledgeable in our industry? Okay, so what I'm going to say next is going to sound like nonsense to a certain portion of your audience. Okay, but you've got to learn to read. And when I say learn to read, <laughs> you, have to, you have to learn to read with the intention of learning something. And not I'm not just talking about technical manuals. I'm not talking about fine home building. I'm not talking about you know, concrete references. I'm talking about all kinds of reading. And when you're reading, analyze how the people are using words mm. and what they have learned. Just you're analyzing how, when you're reading, you're hearing another person's thought stream, if you're paying attention. And if you really pay attention, you can think about how did they arrive at that? What, what, what did they do to get to where they could think those thoughts and what can I pull out of that? And so that is the first thing I would say is if you can't learn from reading, how are you going to learn from reading a set of blueprints or anything else? Right. So that, that would be the first answer. And I don't know if, if that's complete enough for you, but okay. And then the other thing is like, like we have probably mentioned on the channel is determine every day you're going to learn something from the people you work with, even that's if you right. hate them, that's even right. if you right. hate them, mm -hmm. even if they're your enemy. Okay. If you're competing for the same job or, whatever it is, you're going to learn something from them. And, and if you're consistent in that, nothing can stop you. That's right. I mean, I think that's fantastic for life in general, because like you, exactly what you just put up, me and Davis have talked about this before on recent podcasts, and it's you can learn something from everyone. And it's either going to be something you can take with you and use for later or something you know not to do. Right. right. It's, it's it's one or the other. You know, it's going to be something good or something bad. So you can either learn how to not do something later in life or learn how to and just emulate them. Yeah. So for you guys, how much of a learning curve has it been? Oh, let me try to rephrase that. When you because you, Mr. Scott, you've been doing logging, blacksmithing, working with your hands, you know, building for your whole life. And, and Nate, you've been doing. You, you, the entrepreneur, you've been doing the investing, you've been doing 
uh, and some building as well and going to school, getting all that stuff, the numbers, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. So they're two different skill sets that have come together, which is fantastic. It's like a power duo, you know, for this. Mm -hmm. I think the Central Craftsman is incredible in that regards because both of your strengths complement each other's weaknesses, you know, in each area. And how has learning the construction industry, learning the YouTube industry, learning the uh, housing industry, how has that curve been to y'all the more that you've, I'm, the, I'm trying to word it the right way, the more that you dove into like every day, like having to create a video, having to learn how to create videos. Nate, you were talking about like, you had no idea how to edit a video, how to do something or, you know, but you went out there and did it because part of the entrepreneurial spirit is just doing it. You know, most people, most people fail because they don't start. And it's like, it, that's a, a thing that I've seen a lot of people, everyone has ideas, they don't do it. And, and Mr. Scott, you know, you, you just went from blacksmith thing or from logging to saying, I don't really want to do this anymore. I'm going to go build a house. I might, never, might have never built a house before in my life, but I'm just going to try it. So really my question is just, just speak on your experience of maybe not knowing what you're going to do next, but just going out there and start. And how did just starting something shape your next steps into getting to where you are today? Nate, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know to how this will answer your question precisely, but it comes to mind. And that is, I, so I was born in 1982, which makes me one of the oldest millennials. And when I was a kid, well, I should say computers were, I kind of came of age, you know, in high school when computers were around in middle school, but they were so terrible. And same with the internet in high school, I, we had a computer class and it had to have been one of the first times, you know, high schools were getting kids on the internet and it was terrible. And I really got this, it's all, you, by, you almost had to learn how to like force the computer to do what you wanted to do. And like so right. much tr like troubleshooting and problem solving. And like now these computers and all these tools are really intuitive, but man, they were terrible. Then you're constantly like rebooting it and control delete. And so I think that I yeah. kind of got this, like, uh, not a skill, but just like out of necessity of like for like forcing things to like go, I know this will fit if I just, maybe I'll try right. this and just like kind of figuring out like whatever the problem is, if you, you just kind of like keep messing with it enough, you can kind of jam it in place sort of. And I, to some extent <laughs> that sort of skill with that I feel like I developed because of these terrible computers and who knows what other part of my life, but has really helped me in all of the other businesses I've been involved in, whether it's a, a remodel or a type of construction that I know nothing about, but for whatever reason, I've, I've never really been too terrified to not only do it, but maybe buy the property, you know, and really mm -hmm. risk a lot of money and, and a, a lot of financial harm if it goes wrong, because I had have had this like idea that uh, I'll, we'll figure it out. And nowadays with the internet, you know, my dad mentioned how important reading is and it really is, but you know, kind of related having the skills to you know, like use Google properly and just find dig deep and just right. know it's on there, get the information you need or find the person and, and just really get in there and figure it out is a really useful skill. That's been very, very helpful for me all through my real estate business the the prop the storage business that I developed was a total street fight, and I own the only reason it got through is because I have this like stubborn insistence that this I could probably figure out a way to do this. And the video production and all that has been kind of the same story. That all these cameras I got, it's just been a struggle to figure everyone out. But but by just kind of sticking with it, we've been able to. We put out a lot of videos that were pretty bad, you know, in terms of video and audio and all sorts of things. But we never let that stop us from actually putting them up and getting on to the next one. So right. I, I would say for me being, you know, not being too scared of trying something new, not being too scared or, or, or understanding how to find the answers to the problems that you might be having has every, even then when I was in school, school was a struggle and I had to just battle through it. And, and I think that it's really helped me to have a, a mindset that kind of whatever problem I square up to, I could probably solve now i i have a lot of like really great resources obviously my dad not everybody has a dad who can give them the answer they're looking forward with a phone call and i've got a great wife and I, so i'm extremely blessed and i'm not saying that i myself have solved all these problems but the point remains that if you kind of just are a little tenacious about it you can mm -hmm. and don't give up you can usually find opportunities and solutions that don't present themselves immediately 
yeah so so that that was really important that's that's an important little that's a nice short story for for how to to get a, a, a toehold in the, in this 21st century right that really is and he is good at that at solving the problems that on a computer i would just solve it with a six pound single jack okay <laughs> i i just hate it but <laughs> but he it. just keeps he just keeps pecking around the edges and pecking around the edges and try this and try this. And as I'm listening to him talk about that, I realized that that was useful for me in the blue collar sort of mechanical world. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always been kind of discontented if I didn't know why something worked. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, I would be, I would be a little bit irritated and a little bit, um, annoyed and i just didn't like not knowing how something worked mm. i think i probably would have been a good engineer for that reason but so that so that's one thing um that i i know too many people who are perfectly content to not have a clue right and that's man you talk about a rate limiting factor in your life that's one part of that maybe is just not everybody has the same amount of curiosity so you got to cultivate curiosity Cy swan my friend Cy, that you may have met on the channel he is so curious. He's relentless in learning why things do what they do and how to do them. Um, another thing that has been really important to me um, is my friends and my network. Um, it, it's easy for me to engage with people for whatever reason or combination of reasons. And, and that, that network of friends and friendship and trust has been a much bigger asset to me probably than I know, but it, it's a huge asset in every area of my life. And then to um, what, what you just mentioned is that to just start sets you apart from almost everybody else to mm -hmm. just start. And right. I, I built a sawmill when I was 21. Okay. Wow. Um, there was no way that I should, there was no possible way I should have been able to do that. Um, but I just determined, you know what, if I don't know how to do something, I need to just start doing it. And by the time I'm done, I'll probably be pretty good at it. And that, that has worked out for me. And it certainly worked out for Nate with the videos. He didn't know how to make these videos. And now he's better than pretty good at it. He makes a darn good video just because he started. And so I, I think those are really important. Yeah, I love that. You know, Mr. Scott, you touched on the relationship side. I heard someone tell me this before, I'm just kind of opening up to y'all. I was very, you know, I'm 24, so I can't say it was too long ago, but in my mid, you know, last teens, almost 20, uh, I was on these internships. I was hothead, was not doing well, particularly to, in my in my opinion. And someone told me, you know, you're only going to get as, as far as you can with relationships, David. So every time that you talk to someone, you're mad about something and you're ticked off because it did something wrong, you know, you're not going to get very far in life. So you got to be more approachable. So when you talk about relationships, that's a huge side. I love that the networking and being able to talk to people. But then I really love Nate, what you said, um, kind of the feedback that I wrote down was you did the research to figure it out. And then you were kind of fearless. And I summed that up and wrote grit. You know, we've had a few guys that have come on and talk about the, the quality that they most want out of someone that's younger, if they're going to learn from them uh, in construction, or if the older guy can teach the younger guys to have grit. Because if you keep coming back, you keep pursuing, you keep trying, even when you don't feel like it, like Mr. Scott said, even if it's your enemy and you're still going to go learn from them and you keep pursuing them, you know, that's what it's all about. And, you know, you'll get to where you want to be one day. And um, if I can kind of transition just really quickly – I would like to talk about, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about construction and actually kind of dive in a little bit. And Mr. Scott, like you said, you grew up in the trades and that's one of the the, the premise ideas I had of, of developing this podcast was, you know, I saw in the commercial world when I went on these internships, how people maybe look down on some of the trades people and how now even in most of the schools, there are a few, but most of the schools kind of tailor down on you know wood shop or going to have a mechanic class or um, get involved in that while you're in high school and I just kind of wanted to talk about you know what was that that made you want to work in the trades and how has it been for you obviously we've talked about that a little bit but just talk more about that your your experience of growing up from the trades so <clears throat> I 
I didn't exactly grow up in the trades. My dad um, wasn't, my dad was a logger and worked in a mill and then drove trucks. But I perceived that he respected and saw value in trades. And so, you know, we are drawn to kind of do what it is that we see our fathers placing value on. Okay, so I think that was something for me. Um, but I did grow up in a blue collar, hard work. And like Nate said, if someone's waiting on you, you run to get the job done. And that's even more true when it's a machine. If there's a machine waiting on the ground man, growing up logging, you learn to just race because the machine's worth more than you are. And if you're slow and the machine's waiting, it costs everybody money. Mm. So that, that um, the first thing that I learned and that Nate really learned as a kid was to work, to work. And work takes grit. Yep. Work needs work requires that you learn to accept a certain level of pain because work is pain. Everything about work is painful, even if it's just at the level of keeping you from doing something you'd rather be doing. There's an element of pain with that. So you have to become hungry for the work. And at a certain level, you have to be hum hungry for some pain to sort of pit yourself against. Right. Um, <clears throat> so the the. The one piece of advice for every young person is you've got to learn to do the hard thing. The, uh, like right in this moment, maybe the hard thing is just shutting off the video game. Maybe that's the hard thing. So do it once in a while, and then you can go to the next hard thing because construction is full of hard things. The trades are full of hard things. That's right. And you can learn to take immense satisfaction in being able to do a hard thing and and push through that. that uh, reasonable instinctive response to get away from pain you can you can instead develop the gear to get a hold of it and just pick it up and throw it out of the way and do the job so i, I don't know if that even addresses what you just asked really me, but it, it seems appropriate i love that i love that because I, I that just made me think i never really thought about that it's kind of what discipline is you know mm -hmm. when that when that comes, what are you going to do? Are you going to grip on and really tell it no? Or are you just going to sub succumb to it every time? That's right. It, it's, it's a key life skill. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like Jocko Willing. You know, it's, it's discipline equals freedom. And mm -hmm. it's so many people, and I, 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 honestly, especially nowadays, and it's the way the world's going to, it's just the way culturally we as a nation have become of just, yeah. you know, I think people are afraid of pain. Like you were yep. saying, you don't, you don't hear that talked about very much anymore because mm -hmm. most of the time people say, oh, you need to be, you know, this needs to be easy. You need to have a safe space. You need this, this yeah. and that and, and X, Y, Z, you know, and it's like you, you don't. That's mm -hmm. the na Our nation was built on values that you hold and it's hard yeah. work. Go out there and do something with your hands. You know, yeah. and, and this is for both of you. I mean, how much how much do you think your uh, growing up of a building with your hands and like the work that you've done has influenced your, your professional, like career wise and your personal lives as well. You know, cause I feel like there's a, you can tell a huge difference in the lives of people professionally and personally who worked hard, hard work as a kid and growing up versus those who kind of were given everything who had a, a pretty, quote unquote, easy life of, of not having to go out there and work and sit on the couch all day. You know, what is your takeaway of how that shaped y'all's life, Nate and Mr. Scott? Go ahead, Nate. Uh, oh, man, that's really tough. And I, I'm I'm torn on that. And here's mm -hmm. what I'm what I think of. Sometimes I feel like I really well, first of all, I really like working and I really like doing right. the dirty work, did digging and gluing pipes and um, whatever the like kind of tradesman level even like the grunt level, I just like working. And mm -hmm. I know that that has like, in some cases held me back from success because I find myself often, especially in my real estate business, doing the job that I could have hired somebody for $15 an hour. And yeah, that, it took there. me years until my wife finally is like, you got to stop, stop, just pay somebody else. And mm -hmm. that's still really hard because I just like doing it. I like kind of being there. Like right now I'm like uh, gluing the last piece of the septic yeah. together. And <laughs> That's to somebody it's like a division of labor is a real thing. And I, I shouldn't do every single thing. So I'm torn because I like doing it. And I do know a lot of really successful people. And I know one of the reasons that or one thing that a lot of them have in common is they would never dream of like 
doing that right. type of menial task because they they know that their time is worth more at their computer doing whatever thing. So I only say that because I still choose to and enjoy and I spend an enormous amount of time doing the work because I enjoy it. And mm -hmm. if you are thinking about the point of life is to have satisfaction and be proud of yourself and have a good family. And to me, it's, it's worth the trade off. Maybe I could be more successful if I was simply just, I mean, maybe if we put out five EC videos a week instead of two <laughs> and I didn't spend my time like digging holes that, but you know, I don't know how to answer your question. I really like working. I, I like, I guess maybe I'll, I'll sum it up this way. And this goes to the last question that you guys were talking about, which is um, I love working and doing things, especially when I'm learning something new, even if it is very low level kind of grunt, but if there's someone else who's a more expert at that, I, I really love doing that. I, I've never been in a job doing really brutal work for years where you kind of learned it all the first year and then you spent several more years just doing the grunt, not learning something, that would be a really tough situation. And I, I got to advise anybody in that situation, right? shake it up, get another job, go find somewhere else so you can learn something new, separate from working hard, work hard, that's great. But gosh, you got to you got to be learning something new. And then at least for us, by having done that, we've both learned a lots of different types of things, who would have guessed, but as it turned out, we have just enough types of different knowledge to make it work in this YouTube world at the moment. And, and that is only because we've probably both learned lots of different things from lots of different people and places and professions and relationships. And so I would just echo that on, on learning, whatever you're doing, um, learn. And then second of all, I, like I said, I do choose to work still even grunt work because I do like it. And is it more valuable for me to do something else? I don't know, maybe it's almost like you got to have a hobby. So it's nice to be able to even treat it like that. Like the weekend warriors, you know, they got a, they got a great uh, way to live. They can, they can do work and not have to do it under somebody's yeah. thumb. So I, I kind of put myself there, I guess. So, so there's a, there's a ton of philosophy in this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and the elephant in the room is, and Nate and I talk about this is what, do, what do we mean if we talk about success? I mean, what an ambiguous term that it. is. That's and, really good. Yeah. You know, and, and the short and easy and incomplete answer is money. Um, but if you don't have money, you're not successful, right? I mean, it, you hear lots of people talk about, you know, the joys of a simple lifestyle. Yeah, that works just really great until you can't pay your mortgage payment. Okay. <laughs> and then those joys are gone. Yeah. So it, it's just establishing that probably most people can agree that there's got to be a certain base level income. And something better than a base level income is more successful. Okay, but but it's really easy to take that definition too far, right? And then step past the things that Nate was just talking about about the satisfaction that comes in doing something with your hands, right. um, the satisfaction that comes from realizing, oh, I'm just I'm a little tougher than I used to be, and not only that, but my kids are learning to be tough because that whole concept of grit. If you don't learn some grit by the time you're about twelve, man, it becomes a hard thing to learn. That's right. And it's very likely that I should lower that number and say, if you haven't learned some grit by the time you're eight, it's a hard thing to learn. That's good. Along with a lot of other disciplines, right? Lots of stuff has to be in place by the time you're, you know, not too old. Right. Um, and, and it seems like, I, and so I could rant for way too long about our culture and, and the negative <laughs> aspects of what our culture is becoming. Oh yeah. I'm with but, you. But we have, We've begun to think that if it's not easy, it's not good. Right. And what a handicap that is. We've begun to think that if it's not safe, it's not good. There's another handicap. Mm. Um, I mean, Alex Hanold, you guys know who Alex Hanold is? He's the guy that climbed El Cap. It's El Cap, right, Nate? Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I just watched yeah. that documentary. Yeah. Free solo. Yes. Free stinking solo. That was incredible. That is incredible. Is. And safe is the last word you could use to describe that. <laughs> That's right. Sure. Now, I've been critical of that guy because there are young people who watch that and think, man, I can do that. And somebody's going to climb up there and get hurt. All right. But mm -hmm. doggone it. There has to be space. I mean, that's why extreme sports are so popular in our culture, right? It's because we see right. people doing that we things that we wouldn't have nerve to do even at a much lesser level. I mean, there's got to be space to exercise a little courage if you're going to be successful. That's so good. So... 
uh, what else? Oh, comfort. If it's not comfortable, it's not good. Yeah, but comfort is just the flip side of complacency, right? It's two sides of the same darn coin. And so I, I don't know how, how to help all of us as a people recognize that we're living in a new time and more people are comfortable and more people are safe and more people are healthy and more people are living longer than ever before. Right. And we're getting ready to tear that apart because we're letting some of the some of the things we've had a chance to develop rise to the level of virtues when they're not just virtue. They're just maybe pragmatic or reasonable, but mm. it's not a virtue to be safe. OK, That's but it's good to be safe. But I don't know. I, I, I'm a little wacko on these things, but they're all tied into what it means to be successful. No, I agree with you. I, I like it, too. And I, Mr. Scott, I remember you, you've talked about it's kind of like calculated risks, too. You know, but to, to build a house on your own, that's calculated risk. And it, sure, it's not all safe, but yeah, it's safe. You yeah. know, it's just how you look at it. And yeah. you uh, it made me think of is when you started thinking about success, I said, well, it's kind of like the lens you look through it on. I mean, if you look at, at the lens of it's just money, then if you don't have any money, then yeah, you're going to say you're not successful. But if you look at it from a lens of maybe, you know, you value your family and your relationships and you have a lot of relationships and hey, you're, you're successful. And so it really does go down to the lens of how you look for success. And I kind of wanted to go back a little bit. Um, you talked about wanting to be able to learn from someone. And um, one of our values that Walker and I have for this podcast is to welcome feedback. And, you know, I can think of so many times in my life, what I was talking about earlier, where I wouldn't do that. But now, you think for a second to welcome feedback, even when, um, you know, you're not doing something right or doing something good. And if I can just find it real quick, there's, there's a saying that I looked up the other day and I was reading it and it's actually, it's Proverbs 13, 10, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. And I hear that. And I think about, you know, welcoming feedback and having accountability, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for someone to tell you, you know, you're, you're not doing that right. Come learn from me or that's stupid. Come on, come back to me. What do you guys think about that? I think that's the most important concept. I, I, think, that, I, I think that if we, can't, if we can't make ourselves vulnerable enough to learn, if we're not open to constructive criticism, then just start digging the hole. Benjamin Franklin said that most people die at about age 23 and don't have the decency to lay down and be buried until they're about 70. And, wow. and that's what you're talking about is wow. if we're unwilling to learn, then why would we think we should keep breathing? Right. Mm -hmm. And you just identified something hugely important from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Nate, what about you? I, I got nothing really great to nothing. add other than yeah. I, I just agree completely. You know, you, you know, when you see it, you know, uh, whether it's an old man who's made his mind up decades ago or someone like Sai Swan, who we already mentioned, who to this yeah. day is diving into brand new tools and ways of doing things. And uh, for example, he's, he's actually pretty decent on a computer. You know, you, he's just, he's a good example of another way to live. And um, right. Yeah, man, it's, it's, I hope I can, I hope I can be that way myself. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah I mean, this is, this is refreshing, you know, hearing y'all talk about this and, and also just incredible to, to get to learn from you guys. And we're, we're starting to come to the end of our time a little bit. We want to be, you know, we want to value your time and, and not take too much of it, but we like to ask this question towards the end of all our podcasts. It's honestly one of my favorite questions uh, ever, just because the answers we get are all over the place. But so for each of you, uh, if, if you could go back to your 20-year-old self uh, and give yourself one piece of advice with the knowledge and wisdom that you know now, what would that advice be? Mm. That usually stumps a couple people. <laughs> mm. I haven't, I'm, I'm fortunate that I haven't made very many huge blunders so mm. for me the advice i that comes to mind and maybe it would change if i thought about it longer i know that i was and maybe continually maybe i am still uh impatient with mm -hmm. with almost my life in general you know i remember when i was 23 or no 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 i was probably 26 i was like coming to the end of college and i kind of realized i didn't actually learn very much and i did learn about accounting and stuff but i kind of realized like 
oh man, I don't know. So I bought uh, some books about things that I was interested in and it kind of right. realized and I, and reading those like self-help kind of books, I almost instantly became impatient. Like I need to have this wealth or this career, or this family I feel that. right now. And I was 25 and I remember really thinking like, oh, what the heck? I've been working pretty hard. I was paying for my school and yada, yada. And I, and, and even now, you know, as I'm hearing myself say this, I'm reminding myself that you got to be patient for the things in your life that you want. And, and I know when I was younger, I was a little impatient with certain things that I felt like I was ready for right at that moment. Looking back, I'm kind of glad they rolled out just the way they did. But I think I, mm -hmm. I think I might've tortured myself a, a little bit unnecessarily by feeling like I was an, either entitled or deserving or, you know, life was unfair that certain things weren't happening to me that I felt right. like they should have. And, and looking back, that's just, that was just being in my twenties and, and, and now I'm in my thirties. I'm, I'll turn 40 next year. So I'm kind of coming up to the next milestone. And I, I have a feeling when I look back, I still haven't cracked that code, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. I love it. It's really good. Well, I have the advantage now of waiting till the end of the conversation to say something. Right. And, <laughs> So that's one thing that, that we all need to learn, right? It's just to kind of keep our powder dry. <laughs> but um, so I've got several things here. And I, I, think, I think the first one would be if, I, if my one-year-old self could have realized the way my 63-year-old self realizes how short life is and how, how the moments just disappear and that you don't remember them. And so all three of you guys need to realize this too. You won't remember these, these things. They just blur into the past and, and you'll have to see a photograph to remember it. And it is almost as if they didn't happen. Okay, so try to keep track of that. Um, the corollary to that is your kids are gonna grow way faster than you think they are. Yeah. Um, and they'll, they'll just come a moment when they're all grown up and you have no idea how it came so quickly. Um, so the, the quote out of Proverbs that you busted out on us, Davis, is so mm -hmm. powerful that mm -hmm. strife is always a product of pride. Mm -hmm. And, and if there is strife in your life, it, there's another place in Pro Proverbs where it says that contention cometh only by pride. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got contention in your life, mm -hmm. it's because both parties are acting out of pride. Both parties are acting out of pride. I wish I would have recognized that way sooner. Now, at one, a one-year-old, probably not. But really at good. some point, okay, right. at some point, it's powerful to recognize that. Everything, you know, Paul wasn't kidding when he said all things work together for good unto That's them right. that love the Lord. Mm -hmm. He wasn't kidding. And it's hard to believe that. My mom was, she drummed on that so hard. We all got so sick of hearing it. But, but she was right. And um, and I guess the other one would have been that at age one or two, if someone could have helped me understand that there's an old man in my in my future that is going to really wish that you would be wise every chance you get. You know, seek wisdom, just seek it as hard as you can, and it's not right. the same thing as knowledge. That's right. So that's a much wow. longer answer. That's a, that's a much longer answer than what you your question probably supported but there you have no 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 no. i love it you could keep on going that is that's my favorite question to ask just because you get so many different people with so many different backgrounds because like we said earlier you can learn from everyone and we have learned so much from you guys just being in this short time uh it, you know, we had a guy on our last podcast talk about and he didn't it, and the way that he answered it was completely different and he said uh that he would just go back and tell his 20 year old self that, Hey man, you're doing a good job. Just keep going. You know, uh, just encourage himself more. He's like, you, you know, you face some things in your life, but you've ended up where you are now and, and just keep it up. I was like, man, that's, that's a different answer we've had before. You know, it's like, that's, <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. And it's, it's, everyone has something to share, but like, I mean, I wish we'd keep on going forever, but, but thank you guys so much for being on here today. I mean, seriously, it's been an incredible, opportunity uh just very humbling that y'all would take your time out of your day and, and speak to us and, and share your life a little bit well you're very gracious and uh keep up the good work okay thank y'all so thank much you guys thanks appreciate it it was great being here thanks Nate.